It's Sally! Technological change, certainly. 
but key to it has been policy liberalization on both domestic markets and external markets in terms of foreign trade, foreign investment, and so on. Uh, and we see that very much with the younger generation. This expansion of economic freedom has unleashed the animal spirits of ordinary people in a way that one sees very visibly in this part of the world, which one certainly doesn't see in most European countries today. I'm thinking of the younger generation, uh, or indeed in some other places in the West. That's the good news. The bad news is that, again, it's reflected in uh, the economic freedom of the world numbers, and also in other indices, such as the World Bank's doing business in this. The bad news is that economic freedom remains substantially Rest in most Asian countries, uh, and there is huge unfinished business to improve the life chances of as many ordinary people as possible. And that's my overall theme. Let me now flesh it out. I'm going to get into three policy areas. But before I do so, let me provide some historical markers. Uh, for I think we can look back to some key lessons from the history of Asia of Asia's present as well as its future. And I have five key lessons in mind. Let me go through them as quickly as possible. The first is a history of predatory states. So through most of Asia's history, in the last millennium, we have seen kings and princes and rulers who have repressed market institutions and also repressed critical thought. Let's put it this way, the closing of the Islamic, the Chinese, and the Indian minds, uh, to paraphrase, uh, or a little play on Alan Bloom's book, The Closing of the American Mind. We've seen that through most of the 20th century. The most egregious examples were China under Mao, India's license Raj, and Indonesia under Sukarno. So clearly, those are examples not to be repeated. The second lesson, another basic one, is that Asia should emulate the critical factors behind the millennial ascent of the West over the past millennium. Supporting market institutions, allowing for critical thought, allowing it to flourish, and the last main element in the mix, opening up to international trade and commerce worldwide. Uh, if I would use one soundbite to encapsulate why the West took off, in the Industrial Revolution and afterwards. It's trade and Prometheus. Prometheus, technological revolutions that were very much due to institutions at home, combined with interacting with international trade. And that allowed the West to really leave Asia and other parts of the world behind. The third lesson is that Asia can reconnect with past golden ages of commerce. Not in the West, but actually here in Asia. One can think of some land-based empires, like China under the Sung, India under the Mauryans. But what I'm thinking in particular of, is of a particular period of Indian Ocean and Southeast Asian commerce. It's roughly between the 14th and the 16th centuries, before the Portuguese invaded and muscled, muscled in and took over, when there were a series of what you could call poor politics. These were the precursors to Hong Kong and Singapore. Microstates, usually on coastlines, religiously tolerant, sometimes with a Hindu ruler and a Muslim trading uh, elite, or the other way around. Uh, very cosmopolitan, full of trading diasporas, including crucially Arab trading diasporas. Generally speaking, with low tariffs on trade. In Malacca, for example, three to six percent. Some of them with rather sophisticated institutions for international transactions. Malacca also comes to mind. And they had the freedom of the seas, Mari Libera, according to uh, Hugo Bertens. Uh, and trade flourished, as did governance, with a kind of free wheeling competition, not just in economics, but also in politics, during that period before Western colonization. The fourth lesson is really a key lesson from the so-called East Asian miracle. Uh, the takeoff of the first and second generation of East Asian tigers from the 1950s to the 1980s. Now, economists and others are divided here. The mainstream lesson, which the World Bank Report of 1994 touted, 
is that these countries got the basics right. What are the basics? The basics are prudent fiscal policy, prudent monetary policy, a competitive exchange rate, relatively low market distortions in terms of price controls and uh, subsidies, for example, flexible labor markets, openness to international trade, and investments in education and infrastructure. What is in common with these getting the basics right is that these are horizontal economy-wide policies. It's not a picking winners policy. You have a rival camp who argue that what was critical to success of these countries, such as Korea and Taiwan and Japan, was actually an industrial policy of picking winners. The problem with that is that the hard evidence is mostly lacking in terms of aggregate increases in productivity and output in particular sectors and across the board. So the main lesson I would draw, not just from countries which have had conspicuous industrial policy failures, like India and other parts of South Asia, or Malaysia's car industry, uh, or Indonesia's car industry, or more recently, wind and solar power and renewables in China, and shipbuilding and other conglomerates in Vietnam, but also from the supposed success stories of Japan, Korea, and Taiwan, is that selective industrial policy didn't succeed, uh, and in some cases did serious harm. What matters for the East Asia table, and this is the key lesson for the rest of Asia today, is getting the basics right. Final lesson, the opening to the world economy through a combination of multilateral liberalization and unilateral country by country liberalization has been crucial to Asia's growth and success, particularly the increase in trade and foreign investment. So those, running through it very quickly, are my five key historical lessons for Asia's present and future. Let me now move on to what I think are the three key, my three key policy challenges. And I'll start with financial markets, which is perhaps the most complicated story to tell. Financial markets in Asia, financial markets are backward, basic infrastructure, are backward compared with other parts of the Asian economy, and also backward compared with uh, the rest of the world, in the West, but also with some other emerging markets, such as Latin America and Eastern Europe. Now, some argue that this is no bad thing, given what we've seen with financial excess in the West. The main point I would make is that that's an argument against precipitate liberalization. But what it leaves are the considerable costs of repressing financial freedom. So there is a big agenda of expanding financial freedom across Asia. Let me take the obvious example of China. China has, in the midst of what is now a fairly well-developed market economy, essentially a command economy style banking system. The four state owned banks, four insurers, two policy banks. Uh, it also has financial repression in the sense that the government controls and represses the interest rate. The effect of this, to make a complicated story short, is that the state-owned banks, through politicized lending, they're essentially controlled by the Communist Party, channel huge funds to incredibly wasting state-owned multinationals who use lots of capital but don't employ that many people at the expense mainly of the private sector, which is much more labor-intensive, much more efficient, much more productive in China. So the agenda for China, and this is of course critical at a time of leadership change, is somehow or other to expand financial freedom, through liberalizing the interest rate, uh, through opening up the competition, including competition from foreign, foreign services providers, uh, broadening equity and bond markets, and ultimately liberalizing the capital account. Now, the problem with that is that liberalizing financial markets, not just in China, but around the world, and particularly in developing countries, is much, much more politically sensitive than liberalizing product markets, because it gets to the heart of the link between the party, the state, and the key vested interests, as we see with the party states and the SOEs and the state-owned banks in China today. There is another macroeconomic issue that's related. In China, the problem, as we're told, is that there is over-saving, over-investment, and under-consumption. Again, a complicated story. 
But the key challenge for China is to boost private consumption, particularly through the real wages of ordinary Chinese, instead of the benefits being bowled up by the corporate profits of the SOEs. And it's to boost the efficiency of investment, which particularly means private investment in China. Now, as Hayek has told us, this is not going to happen through manipulating macroeconomic aggregates as if they were real live people. It can only happen through real supply side market reforms uh, in the financial sector and in other areas. Now, this takes me back to a point that Vivek de Broglie raised yesterday. It is easier politically to liberalize your product markets, as China has done and as India has done. It is much more difficult, not just in China, but in most other Asian countries, to liberalize your factor markets, the capital market, the land market, and the labor market in particular. Uh, because this gets to that central link between the governing party, the political system, and the key vested interests in business. So therein lies a big agenda on financial markets. Uh, let me now move to my own area, which is trade and foreign investment, foreign direct investment. The good news here is that although we haven't seen a further wave of liberalization uh, in Asia, as we saw in the 1980s and the 1990s, we haven't seen a big rollback in the wake of the global financial crisis either. And that's not thanks to the WTO in the first instance, it's thanks to global supply chains, particularly in East Asia, which provide the best insurance policy against this kind of reversal. If we look at protectionism around Asia, and I have charts here which you can look at uh, at your leisure uh, afterwards, we see huge variation. Hong Kong and Singapore, as we know, are the freest countries in the world when it comes to openness to trade and foreign investment. Next in Asia come the prosperous Northeast Asian countries, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan, South Korea, of course. Then we can see Malaysia and Thailand, roughly in the middle income bracket, and then Indonesia and the Philippines. China and India come next, and then the poorer countries of South Asia and of uh, Southeast Asia, India and China. The problem is less the tariffs, because they have come down considerably across most Asian countries. The problem is mainly with non-tariff barriers, like public procurement contracts, services regulation, um, and all sorts of nitty-gritty domestic issues uh, that are, some of them are captured by the World Bank's doing business index. Uh, and what that shows, very broadly speaking, is huge variation across Asia. Uh, some do very well, like Hong Kong and Singapore. Uh, Malaysia and Thailand, Japan also do well. But some do extremely well, including China, Indonesia, and India, the three big ones. So what that tells us is that while governments have made progress on doing the simpler stuff, which is cutting the tariffs, they have actually not made as much progress as they should have done on the much more complicated and sensitive political of liberalizing non-tariff barriers. And that's where the main market obstructions lie to international commerce in this part of the world. Now, the main way of trying to liberalize trade and FDI in Asia in the last decade has been through free trade agreements. Broadly speaking, it hasn't worked because these FTAs are, as I would put it, trade light. They might tackle the tariffs at best, but they leave aside the more politically sensitive stuff. Trade liberalization and investment liberalization in this part of the world has happened unilaterally. Countries doing it by themselves. It's what I call the Nike strategy. We just do it, of course. And then they copy each other. That's how Southeast Asian countries, and then Korea and Taiwan, attracted global companies who did it together, global supply chains and manufacturing. And that's how India got into global supply chains and services. Well, it wasn't through the WTO in the first instance, it wasn't through 50 years. And that, I think, has got to be the main route in the future. My third big policy challenge is the nexus between energy and the environment. And one final point to note uh, about unfinished business, there are only two Asian countries in the Fraser Institute's index on economic freedom. And those are the anomalies, Hong Kong and Singapore. The rest don't figure in 
gives you an indication of unfinished business. To energy and the environment, there are the energy rich tucked away in prosperous Northeast Asia, but we shouldn't forget that over half of the world's energy poor, that is to say those who don't have access to electricity and who use traditional biomass for cooking, live in, 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 in Asia, and most of them are in India. All the projections show that we'll see roughly a doubling of energy consumption in Asia over the next 20, 25 years. That means an incredible increase in the use of fossil fuels, oil, coal, and natural gas. The problem is that energy markets are throttled even more than financial markets. State-owned enterprises, uh, price controls, export restrictions, subsidies, and so on. So there is an agenda to expand energy freedom, trade liberalization, more foreign investment, unbundling power uh, generation from transmission, uh, from consumption uh, and a few other things. So that's the broad agenda on energy. One key point to add, there is an energy revolution going on in the world, but it is happening almost exclusively in the United States. And Asia has everything to learn and to emulate from what's happening in the United States with shale gas in particular. And the story behind that is very much a story of property rights and open access to competition. China has much more potential reserves than the United States in shale, but it's not likely to exploit it anywhere nearly as productively anytime soon because of some of the restrictions I've gone through in China. On to the environment. Um, we are going to see an inevitable increase in carbon emissions in this part of the world. To cater to, Mike's gone off again. Right. I'll try and that sounds better. Yeah, too good. Um, that sounds much better. Uh, on on the environment front, particularly global warming. Uh, the problem with some of the mainstream uh, proposals for combating global warming, if it is a problem or not, and by the way, I'm not a, I'm not a climate change denier, unlike perhaps some people in this room, uh, but uh, I'm an agnostic is the answer. Uh, but uh, I would, like I suspect most of you here, be very skeptical, not just of some of the climate science, which doesn't tend to deal with long-range uncertainty very well, but also with some of the climate economics, which also, with the modeling, doesn't deal with long-range uncertainty and often comes up with command economy-style solutions. The two most obvious examples are the Stern Report and the Garneau Report from Australia. They should be regarded with a great deal of skepticism because if they are to be followed to cut emissions by 50 to 80% by 2050, it would mean a dramatic pressure on rising levels of energy consumption driven by fossil fuels in, uh, in, in Asia. There is everything to be said for increased energy efficiency and adaptation to climate change if it is happening to a significant level. Uh, and in that mix is trying to get rid of $400 billion worth of subsidies to fossil fuels. But uh, uh, climate mitigation, or carbon mitigation as it's called, along the lines of Stern and Garneau, is something to be regarded very skeptically here in Asia and elsewhere. That brings me to my, my overall uh, conclusion. Uh, and what I'm trying to do is paint that story of not only great success in expanding economic freedom, uh, but also of considerable unfinished business. To try and sum that up, there are three main policy areas for reform. One is getting the basics right. I went through that uh, key list. The second gets onto an agenda of structural reform, which is more complicated, because then you're getting into lots, getting into lots of behind-the-border, complicated, politically sensitive, regulatory stuff. And coupled with structural reform is institutional reform. 
property rights, contracts, making the rule of law real as opposed to a sham, uh, having more transparent and accountable regulatory agencies, better public administration, and so on. Now, given that there is no such thing as Asia, it is, after all, an ancient Greek construct. Given that there is such huge diversity across Asia, there is no identity advantage. Apart from saying that they should all be traveling roughly in the direction of economic freedom, I would split it very roughly into two. There are the low, there are the least developed and low-income countries in Asia. Who are they? It's most of South Asia. It's Indochina. It's the it's many of the interior provinces in China, roughly accounting for say half the population. The emphasis for these countries should be to get the basics right, because there still is huge unfinished business. Uh, they have to do some structural reform and institutional reform, uh, but arguably for them it's much more important to get the basics right. Uh, to continue with catch-up growth, what Paul Krugman once called perspiration. You need to mobilize your inputs of capital and labor, so But then there are high-income and middle-income countries in Asia. Who are they? It's Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan. It's Hong Kong and Singapore. It's Malaysia and Thailand. Those are the key ones. It's the coastal provinces of China, and possibly some of the more advanced guard of states and cities in India. They still have a lot to do in terms of getting the basics right, most of them. But arguably, they need to move to from catch-up growth to productivity-led or innovation-led growth, what Krugman calls inspiration as opposed to perspiration. Now, that involves technological change, enhancements to productivity. That gets you into the nitty-gritty of structural reforms and institutional reforms. It's a different kind of political economy complex to getting the basics right. So that's roughly how I would uh, make the cookie crumble in, in very broad, simple terms. I haven't addressed political systems yet, but I've made one broad generalization, uh, which I think accords with the evidence. You can have catch-up growth, as Asia has shown, with a variety of political systems. It's happening under democracy in India. It happened under authoritarianism in South Korea and Taiwan. Uh, and certainly not under liberal democratic conditions in the full Western sense in Hong Kong or Singapore either. That's okay. But when you then try and make the transition to more advanced productivity-led growth, my argument is that it is very difficult to do that without serious reform of the political system in a liberal and democratic direction. We have seen that transition, however messy, in South Korea and Taiwan, Japan arguably. Uh, we are seeing it now in Singapore. Uh, we're seeing it sort of uh, in a half or hybrid way in Hong Kong. China, of course, is going to be the big laboratory experiment on this. My own feeling is that given a largely unreformed political system. The sclerosis, the stasis, the lack of ideas, and above all the vested interests in that system will prevent the kind of really serious structural reforms or institutional reforms that are necessary to sustain China's rate of growth and indeed the legitimacy of the Communist Party over the next decade or two. Uh, so I think that there may well be some kind of crash or perhaps big tension coming between the political system and the economic system in China. Some, some words by way of conclusion, and it is time to, uh, to, to conclude. My basic message from the Asian story is simple. What we have seen of this expansion in economic freedom is a result of the Adam Smithian or David Humean message, which is one, of course, of limited government and free market. The engine of that is what Adam Smith called natural liberty. Uh, now that's, that's, that's not a popular explanation. It's certainly an explanation that needs to be made, that needs to be sold, because there are too many in Asia and elsewhere who think that the real explanation lies in intelligent bureaucrats and politicians who have socially engineered their societies with clever industrial policies. 
And that's what many outsiders think is going on in China today. My argument is that that's clearly wrong. And certainly the wrong argument to make for the future. The role models for Asia remain the city-states of Hong Kong and Singapore, who are the worthy successors to those port qualities that dominated Indian Ocean and Southeast Asian commerce about four or five centuries ago. Um, now, Hong Kong has become a little less liberal, Singapore probably a little bit more liberal. Uh, there's always an interesting comparison and indeed competition between the two. But they remain, broadly speaking, the role models. And what they suggest to us, I think, is a, is a kind of alternative map, not just of Asia, but of the global economy. Uh, if you think of cities, particularly cities along coastlines that are connected to each other via the oceans, and most international trade still travels to today across the seas, then Hong Kong and Singapore connected these days uh, not through Arab Daos, but through supply chains, as it were, and much of it with cities along coastlines elsewhere in Asia and beyond, do provide very real lessons for laboratory reforms, as it were, in cities and localities, which through a kind of political competition can spread uh, to wider nation states. Uh, those are the broad observations I would make by way of conclusion. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Razin Mustang Sally. We appreciate your, uh, your talk today. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, once again for Dr. Sally.